Hello and welcome to the Donna Show. I am Noah Donna. Today we have a very special guest, Dr. Breggy. Thank you so much for joining me, Dr. Breggy. Thank you, Noah. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Dr. Breggy is the superintendent of the Beverly Hills Unified School District. So, Dr. Breggy, can you first start off by telling us what are the responsibilities of superintendent? The best way to describe it is the uh, superintendent is much like the CEO of a company. Um, people sometimes forget that our school district runs very much like a business as well as uh, providing and delivering education. Um, that's first and foremost is uh, running a successful business uh, as it relates to finances and safety and um, also being innovative, uh, innovative for our students. Um, so those are the main responsibilities and then working with um, all of the people that help make up the school district. So I have the opportunity to work with um, our principals and our board of education and our teachers. So it's a, it's a, it's a big job, but it's, um, it's, it's a job that allows me to, to get out and meet with so many different people. And you're new to our district, so what's your mm -hmm. background before coming here? So I am a former uh, teacher. I, I began teaching uh, third grade, and then I went to the middle school, and I wasn't really sure what level I wanted. So I, I attempted different uh, levels to find out which kids I wanted to be with the most. And then I uh, went into the high school, and that's where I fell in love working with high school students. I was a uh, math teacher, and then I went into being an assistant principal when I, was, uh, when I went into administration. I was a principal of a high school of about 2,500 students. And I uh, had a great time doing that. And then I went into um, upper administration. So I became superintendent of the sixth largest school district in the state of Illinois. And so I had uh, 21,000 students and 27 schools, including uh, four high schools. Um, and from that position, I was recruited to go to a community that's very much like Beverly Hills. Uh, and it's in Highland Park, Illinois. It's the North Shore of Chicago. So I spent some time there as a superintendent for the last three years. Um, and then I finally made it to where I'm going to be permanently home. And that's in California. So that district used to work at had 21,000 students. And mm -hmm. at Beverly Hills, we have around 4,000. So mm -hmm. what are the similarities and differences between the two? So uh, the, the last district I was in actually had 4,000 as well. But the oh. district before that, I had uh, 21,000. That's a really good question because it's completely different. Like I felt more like the mayor in a big school district than I did a smaller district. And I'd walk into schools and buildings and people would say, hi, Dr. Breggy, how are you? And I would look at them and say hi back. And in their heads, I knew they were thinking, he doesn't even know who I am. And that is not my leadership style. Certainly for some people, that like that CEO role, that's, you know, it's not about people, it's about doing the work. For me, it's about the people first and then doing the work. So that was the big difference was I felt like a smaller district I could put my arms around and really get to know people because that's so important to me is uh, getting to know as many people as I can. And after all, we're making decisions about education and some pretty tough ones at that. So want to get to know people and know them by name. And so you're new to our district. What, do you mm -hmm. think, what are your favorite parts of Beverly Hills Unified School District? Oh, gosh. I, so many things. Um, I, I have never seen such an involvement by our, our parent community. And it's so nice to see that our, our teachers and staff are doing things um, outside of being in the classroom, showing up for events. I mean, there is a, something very special here. And so that's something that I've really enjoyed over the last three months is really attending events and seeing staff come back to support students, whether it's third grade or middle school or even high school. So that's, that's been my favorite part to see that. Well, other than all the great things we have, there are a few problems. What do you think are some of the biggest problems facing our district right now? So our biggest problem is some of the financial challenges. And the biggest problem that we have with some of our financial challenges is that it's, nobody is really that interested in school finance. Um, many people, um, it's complicated, it, the way that we're funded by the state. And so a lot of people just rely on other people to get that information. So it's really twofold. It's not only our financial challenges, but it's people getting the correct information about our financial challenges because um, it's complex and it's layered. And so that's a huge challenge for us. So that's something I know that I've been charged with by the Board of Education um, uh, very quickly to come up with budget cuts. 
If you could, in a simple way, kind of explain how our district mm -hmm. is funded. So uh, being a, a basic aid school district, we are uh, we're funded by uh, pr predominantly uh, property taxes and not the number of students that come to school here. And so that changed several years ago. And so even though we have declining enrollment, we have a very expensive system that we're running here with four K-8 schools. So we're essentially running four middle schools um, and, and with very few kids in them. And that's a very, very, exp very expensive model. So that's gonna be a challenge going forward is re-looking at, kind of reimagining, uh, reinventing the way that we are delivering our education. Because the idea is there are amazing things happening here. How can we keep them all and pay for them? Exactly, because we do have such amazing programs, oh. the robotics, cave right here. And, and the thing about that, I'm glad you brought that up, is like we, we shouldn't be stopping with the innovation, we, we should be thinking about what else can we bring here? And so, but right now we have to get our financial house in order. So the, the, the trade-off is how do we keep what we have and then look to see if we can do things differently because I think that we can, not only to save the money, but create more opportunities. I mean, we, we need to start thinking, uh, you know, we have a, a huge responsibility. There, there are jobs that haven't even been created yet and so, you know, we need to prepare our students for that. So you speak of innovation and opportunities. Mm -hmm. What do you see coming? Well, I mean, first of all, it's, it's innovation with um, technology, especially with video that you're doing this here. Um, um, it, that's how people are getting information. We live in this YouTube world now, and, and, and people are not reading any more long newsletters from the district or from a school building. It's really about, it's more visual, and it's, it's people want to be able to understand something, and, and they want to see students as part of it. So I see, think the biggest change that I see coming is the way and how often we communicate with, with others, because a lot of these traditional ways, they're just not getting to the right people at the right time, you know, in a timely manner. So what kind of new technology do you think you want to see in the, in the district? So I would love to see more um, what I call pathways to some of our programming at the secondary level. Um, I'd like to see more of the dual credit programs. I, I'd like to see more academies. I, I, we, we have really bright students here. It, I think it would be pretty cool as, as we start to look at how we deliver our education. I think it would be really cool to start looking at if there's a student with an interest in a certain area, why not start to develop that at the middle school level so that they're at a different place when they're at the high school? Because the high school takes a, an incredible responsibility because you're in a traditional setting, K through eight, and then all of a sudden, the high school kind of opens up as far as, and it's almost like athletics with feeder programs. I just think we need to do a better job, like performing arts as an example. We've got great performing arts in our K-8 buildings, but it would be really nice at the middle school level if there's somebody that's really interested in, in going to theater or drama, like let's let's have a dedicated space with an amazing theater and and really pull out all the stops. That's where I'd like to see it go. Do you see any way we could uh, maybe connect the middle schools more to the high school, kind of create more of a easier transition between the two? I think so. I, I think what's hard now is that it, it's a great thing, and but it's also a challenge for us. And that's life. Is you're, you're presented with a challenge but an opportunity. And I think that many people benefit from staying in that same cohort, people that have grown up here from K to eight. But I also think that it kind of keeps people, you know, in a, in a shell a little bit. And then you wait and, and, and our students have developed long lasting relationships for eight, nine years at, in one school and then they come here. And so you said the word transition, which I'm so glad you said that because that's our job, is to prepare for the most smooth transition. And, and I think we can do a better job in that area. I think that we could have a better partnership um, so that more of our students actually know each other before we say, you know, sink or swim, good luck, go to the high school. Go into the high school. Yeah, exactly. I think we can do a better job. Mm -hmm. So now coming to another thing is the construction throughout the district. Oh, yeah. Yes. Well, what say do you have in that? What kind of oversight do you do on that? So I... Uh, there's so many things that are going on. I, when I, the the person that was in charge of the leadership of construction, 
um, for the school district was removed from their position the weekend before I started. So the day that I started, and I started asking questions about construction, I didn't have that person to go to. So I had to get my information some other ways. So I have found myself in actual construction meetings. And now keep in mind, you know, I was the math teacher and you know, I was the principal and you know, that's not really my background. And, and I, I find it fascinating and interesting, but that's not, I don't wanna be sitting with, with architects and program managers. And so I did find myself doing that. So, I, so the say that I have is now that I've looked to see where we are with construction, I've been able to see some problems. And it, it, part of the problem is that there, there hasn't been this long-term plan. Like, this is massive. Yeah. Like, you know, we have several buildings under construction. So the first thing I asked for was, can I see your five to 10-year plan on what your building construction is? And it really doesn't exist. And so I, that, to me, is was a, a signal that, I, and I'm a planner, so I want to be able to see that. I want to be able to sit down with you and tell you, you know, this is, you know, here, we're in the design stage. We're in this stage. And what I found is we have a lot of, um, some of the problems that we're having with some of the construction is that it's taking longer than it was supposed to. And the sometimes, in many cases, the right people weren't there to sign off on it. And I'll give you one example. Um, like office areas and, and, and spaces for secretaries. You know, that's not my job responsibility, and it's a super important responsibility, but why are we going to have an architect design that space when they don't work in that space? You know, let's have a group of 10 support staff that work, like, come in here, help us. Where, where do you want things? What makes sense to you? That was overlooked. And so, fortunately, a lot of the work that's going to be done in the high school is a lot of those designs have been submitted, but now I'm in a place now, and as, as of last night, I'm so fortunate um, that Mr. Jackson, I get to partner with him um, at, to, uh, to take the lead on some of the construction. But I said to him, we need a long-term plan. Like I want, some of the problems we had in the other buildings were some of the, some of the technology. And, and that has to be designed before things like drywall go up. And so I'm doing a walkthrough my second or third day here, and I asked about that, and they just put up the drywall the, the, day, the, the week before, and they had to pull it all out. I mean, so it's, it's just, it's one hand talking to the other hand, and it's just, that's been missing, but now that Mr. Jackson is here, I'm super excited, because I'm, I'm just a, let's have more voices at the table. You know, it's like, let's get the people that are working in the space, you know, teachers with, where, where your electrical outlets are. You know, we need input. I, we should not be creating and doing all the design work or paying an architect to do it. It's our space. Exactly. So you, you really value input for all different parts. A absolutely. We, we can think we know, um, but, but I know that some people have been rushed with some of the timing. And people, but to me, I'd rather slow down and do it right the first time. What do you see as the five to 10 year plan of our district? It, it won't be five to 10 years before we complete all our construction because some of it's done, but I, I think that we always have to, we, we need a plan that, that has not only the new construction, but just maintenance in general. I mean, we are working with some old buildings and in, in it, to me, I'd rather know, and I'll give you an example, it's kind of a boring example, but uh, like boilers. Boilers are big expenses and it's, I, I'd like to know like on one page, like when was this boiler put in, you know, and, and when, how, what is the average life? So that, so that somebody, anybody can just step in and see, you know, here's the average life. Let's start planning now for working this in the budget, like 10 years out. That's the biggest problem with education. We're so used to planning on tomorrow and next week and now next year. But as a superintendent, I have to look five years out, 10 years out. And so that, you know, there, there needs to be both of that happening. Yeah. What do you see with our budget? What do you think, what's gonna happen with our budget for next year? Uh, the Board of Education charged the administration with cutting $5 million from uh, the budget. Um, and we spent weekends and nights looking at areas that we can cut. And we couldn't find areas, with very few areas, that didn't impact 
student learning and student opportunities. And so we struggled with that. Um, you know, e even there are areas that if you start offering less sections of certain courses, you know, that, that somebody may not be able to get in because they have, you know, something else here. So uh, we looked at that and we came back to the board and we did not do what we were supposed to do. We, we came back and we said, we, you know, we were just over two million. They wanted five because we're already spending more money than we're, we're taking in. So we're already, we're already in the rear. So it's like we, so I'm worried about that because now that we didn't get to the target and it compounds. So it gets, we get further behind each year. So we, as you mentioned before, and I'm glad that you picked up on that, I value that input. So I asked the board and said, we didn't get to where you wanted us to. It, let us go out to the community. Let us talk to students. Let us talk to uh, teachers and find out, what can we do something differently? And we need to look at our K-8s. It's very expensive to run four different middle schools. You know, could we do something different? Like I talked about before with academies. It, when you start to put some of the middle school kids together, you get this critical mass. Like, you know, I, you walk into classes and sometimes there's eight kids. Well, you know, we can, that's not good for the kids, it's not good for the program, and it's, we can just do a better job, but there's a lot of traditions in the community, and we have to find out what the community values. And all this is done for the students. So mm -hmm. what advice do you have to students? You know, get involved. I mean, we're gonna, um, I would love to have some students, uh, we're gonna do some community engagement, because I, I, they didn't hire me to come in and turn the district upside down, um, because I, the district's doing just fine. Um, but they've asked me to come in and do some fine tuning, and I feel like I, I would love for students to join us for this community engagement piece, and because there needs to be some education first. We we can't expect the community to give us input on something that they don't really know what we're asking. So I'd love to be able to have a group of students join me, work with me, do some community engagement, and you know, and this is different places in the community, and say, here's our problem. And we want to be sustainable financially in the future, and 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 you know and get their thoughts about you know ways to save money. I mean, uh, it it can't be top down. It can it just will not work that way. It can't be my plan. It can't be you know uh, it's a board member's plan. It has to be the it, the community. These are community schools. And then so finally, the question I'd like to ask all my guests is, mm -hmm. what is the best advice you think you've ever received? Oh gosh. Um, I think the best advice that I've ever received was don't do your job just to keep your job. And so there's some a political tone to that that you know don't you know don't make a decision if it isn't something that you truly believe in just because it's a safe move or you want to keep your job. Um, and you you do your job and you have your own core values and um, you, know, you heard a lot about my personality today. That's who I am. Well, Dr. Becky, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Noah. Thank you for watching, and we will see you next time.